Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining today in our Creating Municipal Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory webinar. My name is Ryan Patel. I'm the Energy and Climate Change Advisor here at the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. Um, I appreciate uh, everyone joining through Teams live events today. Um, it means that you are muted and your video camera is off. You're essentially seeing a stream of today's presentation. Uh, if you do have questions, you can submit them as a text in the Q&A chat box. I've left a comment there so you can hopefully see that pop up. Um, so feel free to leave uh, your, your questions as we go through the slides today and we'll address them towards the end. We'll also be having a recording uh, for this presentation um, for your later reference or if you want to uh, share it with anyone uh, you might think will find it interesting. I'd like to start by acknowledging that this presentation is being presented to you from Treaty 6 territory where I am today. This land is a traditional meeting ground, a gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakoda Sui. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries and whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant communities. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Action Center, um, we provide funding, technical assistance and education to support Alberta municipalities in addressing climate change. And the Action Center is a partnership between three organizations, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, as well as the Government of Alberta. So for today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Partners for Climate Protection Program to get started. Then I'll jump into the bulk of today's topic around inventory basics, some basic steps that you can use to create an inventory. I'll touch on business as usual forecasting, and I'm really excited to be joined by our guest today, Evan Camo from the city of Lethbridge uh, for a case study on their inventory uh, down there. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll take questions towards the end of the presentation, but if you do think of something, feel free to type it in the chat box uh, so you don't forget about it by the time we get to uh, the end of the slides. So this webinar is being delivered to you through the Partners for Climate Protection Program, or, or PCP. Uh, the program is managed and delivered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, as well as ICLE Canada, and it receives financial support from the Government of Canada and ICLE Canada. It's also the Canadian component of ICLE Cities for Climate Protection International Network. And since the summer of 2019, the Action Center has served as the Regional Climate Advisor for the program, supporting the member municipalities in Alberta. So the PCP program guides municipalities through a five-step milestone framework. Uh, you can see them outlined on the slide today. Um, the framework is really there to support taking action on climate change by reducing emissions in municipalities. Today, we're really going to focus in on milestone one, creating uh, emissions inventory and a forecast. If you do want to learn more about the other four milestones or the program in general, you can get in touch with me. I'm happy to chat and we also have many resources and uh, some previous webinar recordings uh, on these topics. So we'll jump right into it. Um, first, just to ask the question, you know, what is an emissions inventory? Uh, basically, an emissions inventory is a summary list of three main types or categories. Uh, we have emission sources um, that release emission, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. We have sinks that remove GHGs from the atmosphere. And we have reservoirs, which are a long-term storage or accumulation of emissions um, away from the atmosphere. Typically, emissions are calculated based for a specific location and duration of time. Uh, so a uh, quick example, um, the electricity used to light your recreation center over a year is an emissions source. Um, when we think about the municipal context, uh, we want to collect data that quantifies the amount of energy that's being consumed and solid waste that's being generated by your community and municipal operations. And I'll touch on some of those details a little bit later. Oh. Um, before we get there, I um, kind of wanted to stop and think about or, or highlight some reasons why inventories are important. Uh, they really can provide some valuable information that describes how much emissions were being produced by our actions, uh, which is key to understand 
understanding our environmental impact, as well as a pretty foundational step in developing a long-term plan to reduce emissions. Um, for municipalities specifically, uh, the inventory can be a valuable, to, to, a valuable tool to build awareness for energy use. It can reveal energy consumption trends and waste generation information. Uh, it lets you understand how external factors can impact environmental footprints, you know, things like the weather or population growth and the impact they have on our emissions. It lets us track future emissions, energy consumption and costs, um, allowing us to assess what activities or sectors can produce the most emissions. Uh, it can give a baseline to measure progress against. Uh, on that, I'll touch a little later as well. Um, it can help impact policy creation and implementation uh, as a tool to evaluate where we have opportunities for energy efficiency and cost savings. Uh, it can help prioritize um, what types of reduction efforts we want to take on. It can help us focus local economic development opportunities for, for new projects as well. Uh, and something that maybe is a little bit more of a, a soft skill is that it helps us uh, with relationship building. Uh, I think I've seen with several, several municipalities that the person in charge of the inventory uh, is often one of the only people that's communicating across multiple departments. Um, they can really build uh, or I guess take down some of those silos. So when we think about inventories, it's a really good practice to have boundaries um, and the boundaries allow for specific information to be tracked and analyzed. For municipalities, there's generally two accepted types of inventories, a corporate inventory and then a community inventory. The corporate inventory will outline emissions generated directly from municipal operations, buildings, services, um, things that a community has direct control and influence over. And then the community inventory is an estimation of emissions that are generated within uh, the boundary of a municipality. Um, so this is a little bit less, I guess, yeah, a little bit more indirect control for emission sources, um, but they fall within that boundary. And then typically uh, most corporate emissions will fall underneath a community inventory as indicated in this infograph, um, but there are a couple of exceptions. <clears throat> so members in the PCP protocol are encouraged to use uh, the, the protocol. Um, having a protocol, it really provides municipalities a, a clear, uh, some clear accounting and reporting guidelines. Um, and those are used for both corporate and community level inventories within the context of the PCP program. Um, like I mentioned, the protocol is important to, because it creates guidelines. Um, but it also creates a reliable, accurate, and a pretty generally accepted way to measure emissions uh, for all members across the program. So the protocol when it comes to the community corporate inventory um, it includes a couple of key sectors that we want to make sure are included. Um, this includes uh, buildings, um, things, you know, municipal government uh, facilities and operations. Um, it can include the fleet. It can include uh, traffic and street lighting, uh, water and wastewater treatments, as well as corporate solid waste generation. Uh, similarly, uh, we also have uh, some guidelines for the community inventory. Uh, the PCP breaks down sources in bigger activity sectors, residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, and solid waste. Uh, so these are some mandatory sectors. Uh, we also have other locale specific sectors um, if they have significant emissions, things like agriculture or forestry, uh, but they can, but they are also, uh, they're not mandatory. They can be included, but they're not uh, within the guideline of the PCP protocol. So creating an inventory is kind of, it. we've broken it down into four key steps. Uh, the first step really is to define the boundary for where we're measuring emissions. Boundaries can be physical, organizational, jurisdictional, and the protocol again is in place to provide guidelines uh, for both corporate and community. So for corporate, this is typically an organizational boundary. Um, as we've kind of hinted at, activities that are under the operational control uh, of the municipal government. Um, this is a bit difficult sometimes to, to kind of differentiate where this boundary lies. 
um, because uh, every community is different with unique roles and responsibilities, um, but this is why it's the first step in determining what we need to define. Uh, and then for community, it's more of a jurisdictional boundary. Um, again, uh, whatever kind of falls within the administrative boundary of your local government is typically the scope that we use. Um, so for the PCP members, I would certainly recommend using the protocol to help define that boundary. Once a boundary is in place, uh, we can look at step two, selecting an inventory year. Uh, having a base year, um, it's pretty important. We want to have something that's uh, fairly current with reliable and complete data. Um, the base year is something that we need to have in place to help measure future emissions against. Again, this will vary from community to community, uh, but we do want to focus on a year with data that is that has all three of those criteria, current, complete, and reliable. Uh, another consideration that you might want to look into is the alignment with other jurisdictions, other municipalities. Um, are, your, are your neighbors setting, tar setting inventory years um, that you might want to mirror? Um, are there provincial or federal uh, years that you want to align with? Um, this is important to consider. Um, it can increase the data availability um, as well as your ability to compare uh, compare reduction targets and, and just general progress as we move forward. For step three, uh, we're kind of moving into data collection. Uh, we want to consider the types of data that are being collected. Um, so as we've kind of hinted at with our different types of emission sources, uh, we want to consider energy use. Uh, typically this is electricity or natural gas or other fuel consumption. Um, transportation, you might want to look at things like vehicle kilometers traveled, the types of vehicles, the fuel used in these vehicles. And then if we're doing waste, we want to look at the waste composition, uh, the volume of waste that we're generating, how we're disposing of that waste. Uh, basically, we want to kind of understand what we're looking for and what types of data that will be needed. Where possible, we, try, we want to try and gather anything that we would consider uh, real data. Um, that's that's to say anything that's an actual measure of consumption. Um, it might be you know reading a meter at a building, uh, a fuel input point, uh, might be a purchase record. Um, those those things that give us an actual measure of consumption. If we don't have access to real data, we can use other methods, um, surveys, models to kind of build some information out. And then when we don't have local data, which invariably can happen. Uh, we can use regional or national data and then scale that down uh, using the right indicators, you know, population, area, etc. I think one, one point I'd like to kind of uh, suggest is that data collection is a bit of a trade-off between accurate data and then collecting data easily. Uh, we, want, we want to be able to have an inventory that's as accurate as possible but we also want to be able to spend a realistic time on the inventory and be able to move ahead in the actual mitigation work. Uh, so with, with that step completed, uh, our last step is to take what we've uh, collected and actually quantify emissions from it. Uh, more often than not, the quantification involves some sort of calculation I think uh, some people come to this step and, and they get uh, overwhelmed. They, they might think it's complicated, um, and, and it is, um, but there is a, a basic premise that can be used uh, to kind of think of it in a very straightforward method. Uh, we just want to convert our activity data to emissions. Um, and we can do this in a very basic uh, example uh, of multiplying the activity level or the rate um, that we're looking at by its corresponding emissions factor. So the acti activity data, as we've uh, done already, um, is the level or rate of a specific action that produces emissions. Um, we want to have something that's exact and specific as possible. And typically, it refers to some sort of energy consumption or waste generation. Um, so for example, it could be the amount of fuel used in a car. Uh, and then the other side is the emissions factor. Uh, which represents the rate or quantity of emissions that are being released because of a specific activity. Uh, there are ways of calculating this or, or determining this internally, 
Uh, but the PCP program recommends that municipalities use emission factors that come from Environment and Climate Change Canada's National Inventory Report, uh, which is a, a report that uh, basically summarizes different uh, activities and their emission factors across the country, and it's updated annually. So just a quick example of how to use this quantification uh, translation. Um, we, we can look at our activity data and our example of fuel. Um, so we know that over a year uh, we've, consumed, we've consumed 500 liters of diesel. Um, and then we can go to the National Inventory Report, pull out an emissions factor that's specific to diesel consumption. Um, I've pulled it out here for us, uh, that's 0 0.002757. And we just multiply that by our, our amount of fuel that we've used, and we get our emissions uh, for the year for diesel consumption. So uh, if you kind of think of this basic methodology, you can uh, kind of simplify the approach to emissions. Um, obviously, some calculations will have multiple things to consider, um, but there is a very basic premise you can use to uh, kind of get going. Something to consider in all, all of these steps and all the work that we do around emission inventory are a couple of basic principles. Um, well, there's, there's six of them that apply uh, generally. We have accuracy, uh, reducing uncertainty in what we're collecting, um, completeness, um, making sure we're painting the whole picture, uh, consistency, being able to compare against things uh, meaningfully, um, Relevancy, um, we want to make sure that we use the appropriate sources and methodologies. Transparency, when it comes to documenting what we're doing. And then conservativeness, we want to try and um, estimate things on the lower end of values. These principles are outlined in the international standard for GHG accounting and reporting, ISO 14064. Um, and we want to try and keep these at the top of our minds when we work um, on inventories to make sure that we have true and fair accounting and reporting of emissions. Um, one last aspect of the inventory um, that I want to touch on is something called a business as usual forecast. Using our inventory, we can basically project what will happen in a future emission scenario if no intervention or mitigation actions are taking, taking place. Um, so basically, what does the next 10, 20, 30 years look like if we don't do anything about our uh, footprint? Um, this sort of baseline creation is important because it allows for a comparison between the potential different emission reduction options or actions um, and that no action scenario. Uh, so when we think about more of our long term goals of creating an emissions target or, or developing a plan, uh, this this forecast uh, can help us prioritize our actions uh, and guide that mitigation work. So I wanted to just pull a quick example of what this can look like. Um, so here's a business as usual forecast um, for Canada as a whole. Um, so the, the black lines are emissions that have actually been measured and quantified. Um, and then the red and blue show two different projections for emissions. Uh, the red line is an emissions projection from 2015, blue is one from 2016. Um, so you can see like as actions occur, um, baselines can change, um, the, the forecast can change. Um, and then I also included uh, this graph because uh, it shows you in an orange dot uh, what the national emissions target is, 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. And then we can also see there's a sizable gap between uh, the projections and what the national target is. So for those uh, PCP members that are joining today, um, which are already working on their milestone one, um, there are a couple of things you're required to submit to receive the, uh, the achievement. Um, one is a summary of your inventory, uh, as well as the data sources used. Um, we want to see some details around what's what's been included for assumptions, emissions, or any other relevant data. Uh, again, going back to that transparency principle. And then we also want to see that business per usual forecast. So there are a couple of things required um, for that milestone one completion. I also wanted to talk a little bit about some resources offered in the program. Um, the big one is the PCP tool. Uh, this is available free for all PCP municipalities. Uh, it's an online web-based uh, software uh, and you can 
it can be used for the development and management of greenhouse gas inventories. It's a bit difficult to kind of show the tool um, in a presentation, but here's a screenshot of uh, one of the screens that's available. Um, basically, you can use the tool to, to uh, capture your data, um, uh, measure and, and manage your emissions, both for corporate and community uh, sc scopes. Um, and then kind of play around with uh, the inventory and see, see the different sectors and how they correlate um, and then use this to plan ahead. And, and I believe that Evan will talk a little bit about how they use their data and, and, and show us some, some graphs, um, which is a good kind of transition piece. Um, so I'm excited to be joined by Evan Kamo today. Um, currently, Evan is the City of Lethbridge's Environmental Sustainability Analysis. He has led the recent updates of the City of Lethbridge's Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory, and they've used the inventory um, at City Council, um, which have set a corporate emission reduction goal of 40% under 2018 levels by 2030. So thanks for being here today, Evan. Um, let's do the transition here as smooth as possible. Perfect, looks good. Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks, uh, Ronick, Ronick, for having me here today. Uh, very excited to join everybody. Um, thank you for joining in as well, all the members out there. Um, so yeah, my name is Evan Kamal. I'm an environmental sustainability analyst with the uh, City of Lethbridge. I'm here to chat about our greenhouse gas inventory and uh, the steps that we took to get there. Um, so uh, more information on what we're going to do today. I'm just going to provide a short uh, introduction to Lethbridge. Um, talk about why uh, why to, why you should complete a greenhouse gas inventory. Ronick already talked about this a little bit, but I'd, I'd like to share my reasonings for for why you should do it as well. Um, chat about our inventory and our calculation procedures. I'm going to provide a couple of examples of some analysis you can do with your greenhouse gas inventories, and then maybe some uh, challenges you should expect um, along the way. Uh, so for an introduction to Lethbridge, um, we are located in southern Alberta. Uh, we're a population of about 101,000 people. Uh, we are about two and a half hours southeast of Lethbridge, or sorry, two and a half hours southeast of Calgary, about an hour and a half east of the Rocky Mountains and 45 minutes north of the American border. Our industry here is historically has been mining and agriculture. However, we are transitioning to a more diverse economy down here. Um, for our climate, uh, we have what's known as a cold semi-arid climate, which means typically low precipitation. And we have those good old Chinook winds that some of you may be familiar of, familiar with. Uh, just basically just warm winds that come off the mountains and blow pretty strong in the winters. Um, we are usually in the top 10 for the driest municipalities in Canada and usually around second place for the windiest in Canada. Uh, so more of an introduction to our uh, climate action that we've taken here in Lethbridge. As Ronick mentioned earlier, we have completed our um, inventories for our corporate and community sectors. So that uh, allowed us to achieve milestone one. Uh, as Ronick also mentioned, we did set a reduction, a greenhouse gas reduction target for our corporation uh, last year. Uh, so that allowed us to achieve milestone two on the corporate side. Um, However, the community side is still in progress. Um, also, we're working with a consultant on an energy conservation master plan, which will highlight a bunch of different environmental initiatives that uh, the corporation can take. Um, and so I just want to also mention Environment Lethbridge. They are a public nonprofit organization here in Lethbridge that does some work on the uh, community side. Uh, they're a good stakeholder with us, and uh, we're always happy to work with them. So uh, why why to complete a greenhouse gas inventory? So here in Lethbridge, we like to throw around the term walk the talk every now and then. Um, basically, you know, there's some new initiatives always coming out in all levels of government, whether it be federal, provincial or municipal. Um, we always want to make sure that we're leading the way in these uh, in these initiatives. You know, um, we want to make sure our citizens look up to us as a municipality and uh, and lead the way. 
Um, in terms of actually creating the baseline, as Ronick also mentioned, it lays the groundwork for greenhouse gas reduction projects. Any, any project or initiative that uh, is planning to reduce emissions, you should always have a baseline, always have where you began to see how the project actually affected your greenhouse gas totals. Um, and it also provides a better understanding of your municipality's profile. I mean, for example, uh, the third slide I talked about in this uh, presentation talked about our population and our location and um, our industry, but it's also another thing I could talk about when it comes to Lethbridge is our greenhouse gas profile. So it, it just provides a better understanding of your municipality when you create these, these inventories. Okay, now to jump into our greenhouse gas inventory here in Lethbridge. So this is our community sector of our inventory. So we have those four main categories that Ronick mentioned, the residential buildings, commercial and institution, institutional buildings, industrial buildings, and uh, transportation. Unfortunately, we don't have the 2020 uh, inventory completed. We're still waiting to receive some of that data. Um, I know it's going to be quite interesting to see with uh, the COVID impact on emissions uh, in our city, as well as emissions around the world. It's always been interesting to see uh, the effect that COVID had on the environments around the world. Um, yeah, unfortunately, though, we don't have that data. Um, for it, on average, each year, we're typically around 1.3 million tons of CO2 equivalent produced over the course of the year. Um, as I mentioned, we have these four main categories. Uh, we are working on those optional categories that Ronick mentioned as well, um, primarily the air travel and agriculture options. Um, those are attainable for us as of now, so we're working on those. And then on the right there, just have a quick little chart there to show uh, the annual tons of CO2 equivalent per capita. This is a, it's a good metric to use when comparing to uh, even Canada or other cities around the world. Um, we're at about 15.2 tons of CO2 equivalent per capita. Um, typically, you'll see the cities in Saskatchewan and Alberta with having a higher ton uh, tons of, tonnage of CO2 equivalent per capita. That's typically because of uh, our reliance on coal to produce our electricity. Other provinces in Canada have been switching to some more renewable methods. Um, so uh, in turn, that gives us a higher uh, tonnage per capita. Now to dive into uh, the transportation uh, category of the community sector, um, I just wanted to share how we calculate this this category. Uh, we we use the method um, involving vehicle kilometers traveled. Um, this first of all, before I start, this method is described in the PC protocol that Ronick mentioned earlier. Um, Basically, it takes the annual vehicle kilometers traveled or the VKTs, um, and we get this data from our transportation department. They have multiple traffic counters set up all over the city. Um, so we get this data. Um, the next step is to allocate these vehicle, or these uh, kilometers to different types of vehicles. Now we get that data from Alberta Transportation. You can submit a data request to them and they'll actually give you uh, the quantities of the different types of vehicles that are registered for your city. Um, once we have that data, we allocate those uh, kilometers, those different types, um, and then we actually convert those kilometers to liters consumed based off of that vehicle type's fuel efficiency. Now, for example, the uh, the standard passenger car um, has a, a fuel efficiency of about 9.0 um, liters per 100 kilometers and that's always that little ratio that you see on the car windows when you go to um, car dealerships. Uh, we just use those numbers to convert uh, those kilometers to liters. Once we have them in liters we can multiply them by the emission factor to give us the tonnage of CO2 equivalent. Now I know that might have been a lot to follow at once but as I mentioned it's in the PCP protocol it's very easy to follow in there. Uh, and then for buildings, um, I just put all these three categories on the same slide because we usually we, we find this data pretty much the same way. For electricity, we uh, attain the consumption from uh, our electric utility department, um, and then we actually group them by rate class. So if you're not familiar with what a rate class is, uh, it's basically a group of customers uh, using a prescribed amount of electricity. So most residential houses are in the same rate class. So we know that we can use that rate class for the residential buildings category. 
Um, and then other rate classes will be designed for uh, commercial buildings, uh, medium sized office buildings. So we, we can group our buildings uh, that way. And then for natural gas, uh, we just obtained this, um, this quantity. Uh, it's provided by our supplier, which, uh, you know, they also provide an estimation on where this natural gas is sent, what type of buildings are using it. Um, and then we use that data to, to calculate our greenhouse gases. Uh, so that was it for the community sector. Uh, now for the corporate sector, um, you can see those five, those same five categories that Ronick mentions: buildings, fleet, streetlights, water and wastewater, and solid waste. Uh, one important thing to remember uh, for us is that we own our landfill, so we have to report our solid waste emissions on the corporate side. Um, also, actually, sorry, and then yeah, here we are. Um, this red line actually shows where we would be with without COVID because we actually do have the 2020 values for um, our corporation. Um, we saw an actual about a 9% drop in our emissions uh, based off of our business as usual forecast. Um, so that was kind of interesting to see there. Um, and then also we are, uh, it's about 6%. Uh, our corporate emissions, our total corporate emissions make up about 6% of the citywide greenhouse gases. Now to dive into the uh, solid waste side. Um, as I mentioned, we do own our landfill, so we have to report all these emissions on the corporate sector. Um, I use the waste in place model. Uh, again, this is in the PCP protocol. Um, what we do here is we use historical quantity of landfill waste. So that was something that was uh, attainable for us. We do have documentation of landfill waste um, at our waste and recycling center. So I can get that data pretty easily. Um, and then essentially, I'm not really gonna describe it because it is pretty extensive formulas and, and stuff you need to follow. But again, the instructions are in the PCP protocol. At the end, it essentially produces an estimated quantity of methane produced for that given year. There are some other types of formulas or models that you can use that will uh, give you the estimated total methane that a certain quantity of garbage or a certain quantity of waste would produce over that um, quantity's lifetime. And But this method is a little easier, I think, because it actually gives you in a given year how much was produced, which is a little more important when you're trying to do these inventories based off of inventory years. Uh, so then for the all of our buildings here in uh, in Lethbridge, uh, I grouped water and wastewater, streetlights and the buildings category all together. Um, so again, you can see actually on this on this graph, the yellow bar and the blue bar, you can see that they're pretty much the same. And this is one interesting reason for why the PCP requests that these are separate. Um, our water and wastewater plants here in Lethbridge you use up about the same amount of electric or about the same amount of energy as the rest of our buildings combined. Now that's pretty standard. That's pretty common across all municipalities around the world. Um, but it is uh, it's, it is interesting to see, and that's why uh, they asked to separate it out and not just include it in the buildings uh, category. So for these three uh, categories here, we uh, retrieve the annual consumption uh, through an asset management software called Asset Planner. Basically, this program uh, compiles all the utility bills for all of our buildings and allows us to retrieve the natural gas usage or the electricity usage. It allows us to publish reports, um, produce trending graphs, all kinds of good stuff that we can use to calculate our greenhouse gases. OK, and then the last category, just uh, talking about the fleet uh, for our uh, corporation. Um, our annual consumption is retrieved from reporting software that is uh, managed by our asset management department as well as our fleet department. Um, this publishes data based off of fuel usage for different vehicle types that we have uh, in our fleet. And uh, once they're grouped by vehicle type, we can use those emission factors, even from that example Ronick did earlier in this presentation. Um, you can use those emission factors to uh, solve for the greenhouse gases for this, um, yeah, for our inventory. Okay, now some analysis examples. So here's one thing that I 
found uh, a couple years ago, actually, when I created this inventory. So if we look at this graph, um, we have the inventory years 2014 to 2017, and this is the or the community side, just the buildings categories. So we have residential buildings, commercial and institutional buildings, and industrial buildings. Now, you'll see on this graph that during the middle years, 2015 and 16, we saw a dip in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, started out in 2014, dipped down to 2015 and 2016, and then rose back up to 2017. And that was consistent for all three of these categories. So that was a little bit, um, it made me a little curious. Well, how come this is happening? We are a growing city down here in Lethbridge. Our population increases at about 2% every year. So why is there, why was there this dip, right? So I looked into it. Uh, and it turns out that this dip was actually caused by a dip in natural gas usage over the course of those two middle years. Now, if we think about natural gas and how it's used in buildings, typically it's used for heating, either heating the building itself or hot water heating. So um, I actually looked at the average temperatures um, for those two years in the winter. Now this is this graph might be a little challenging to read because we are in negative values, but Essentially, in those two years, 2015 and 16, the winters were actually warmer. So therefore, since the weather was warmer in the winter, less natural gas was used. And therefore, we, that's why we saw that dip in uh, greenhouse gas emissions for those two years. So, you know, it's an interesting thing because that, again, shows more of an understanding of your of your municipality and your climate and how that climate can affect your greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then um, an obvious one to chat about this here. I'm sure a lot of municipalities are going over this um, COVID 19's effect on on greenhouse gas emissions. So I looked at our natural gas usage for our buildings and turns out there wasn't much of a, a change from uh, uh, from the impact of COVID 19. I, I believe that's probably because as COVID 19 was hitting us here in Canada around March and April. Weather was already starting to warm up by then for us. So natural gas was already being used less. So there really wasn't much of a decrease, but this graph here shows our city owned buildings and their electricity usage for 2019, which is the orange bar, and then 2020, the blue bar. So you can see um, for our, all of our city owned buildings combined um, in April of last year, there was a pretty significant dip. Now, we, we were sent home as were most municipalities. We were uh, sent to work from home and made that transition. So therefore, our city buildings were being used less. A lot of our recreation buildings were closed. Um, museums were closed. So again, that these buildings aren't being used as much. The electricity wasn't turned on as much. So therefore, less electricity. Um, you can really see it in the, uh, these are only our culture buildings. Uh, so these are our libraries, museums, theaters, and art galleries. A lot of these were closed as soon as, it, as soon as COVID hit. So again, you can see that dip compared to 2019. Um, this dip is most prevalent though in our recreation buildings. So these are our ice rinks, our baseball fields, um, pretty substantial uh, decrease in electricity usage as soon as COVID hit in March of last year. Uh, you can see it was beginning to return to normal towards the late summer, early fall, but once uh, the cases started to rise across Canada and here in Alberta, um, more restrictions were put in there in late November and December, which caused a lot of those rinks to close back down. And so there you go, there's the electricity decrease as well. And uh, getting to the end of my presentation here, just some challenges for us that we, you know, that I face creating these inventories. Um, developing the physical greenhouse gas inventory. So municipalities can do this in many different ways. I've seen spreadsheets, seen all kinds of different things, and it can be kind of daunting to, to think about creating your own greenhouse gas inventory. What I would really recommend is the PCP tool that Ronick mentioned. It's, it's, it's a very easy, it's very straightforward tool to use. Um, it's a lot of fun for me personally to log in there and look around. I keep our inventory on the PCP tool as well as on spreadsheets. Um, very easy to use. I highly recommend that. Um, another challenge is basically different reporting methods from different levels of government. Um, you know, the federal government might use emit different emission factors compared to provincial governments. 
the methods of reporting for greenhouse gas inventories might change a little bit depending on the province or the uh, federal government. So keeping on top of those is, is a bit of a challenge that, that you can expect when it comes to working in this field. Um, another one that I'd, we can all talk about here in Alberta is the political climate around greenhouse gases. Um, I've always found that it's a little bit challenging to, to speak about greenhouse gases um, in this part of the world. Um, and it, my, my advice for this is if you ever get pushed back from the simply the term greenhouse gas, um, I find if you could just keep the conversation in terms of dollars, uh, you know, a lot of business unit managers, council, we're all focused on, you know, um, operational costs right now, especially in this COVID time. So instead of just simply speaking about greenhouse gas reductions, um, talk about money savings. I, most of the time, greenhouse gas reductions align with operational cost reductions. So why not why not talk about that? And I think that's a that's a useful piece of advice for anybody who's starting out in this field right now. And my last thing, my last challenge that I had is that there's always room for error when you're calculating all these emissions. Um, for example, uh, when I was talking about our transportation community inventory. Um, talked about how we get data from the Alberta Transportation Department uh, about the number or the different types of vehicles that are registered here in Lethbridge. Well, what happens if somebody's registered a vehicle here and then drove it to Montana and lived in Montana for a year? Why would that vehicle be included in our inventory if it's currently in Montana? And you're always going to find those little errors, those little discrepancies in, in these inventories, and it's totally normal and it's totally common. The, we're we're quantifying an invisible gas when we do this. It's a very challenging work and it's very hard to be exact. So as long as you're okay with just the discrepancies and just always making sure that you know that this is an estimation, okay? And it's not to be taken as an exact value with perfect accuracy, okay? It's just, we're creating an estimation of our greenhouse gases for our inventory and it just needs to be kept as that. And that's all I have. Um, thank you for uh, listening to me. I think I'll transition this back to uh, Ronick. Thanks, Adam. That was a really great uh, kind of overview, a case study of Lethbridge. You know, uh, really appreciate you speaking about um, the, the challenges that you face and then your suggestions towards them. I think to that last point, you really kind of agree with the idea that you don't want to spend too much time looking at the details. Um, because it limits our ability to move forward and actually make some progress uh, with projects. Um, so that, that was great to hear. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in. I'll encourage everyone listening to, uh, to type your questions. Um, the first one is more just on logistics. So will there be a presentation available online afterwards? Um, so yes, there'll be a recording. Uh, we'll push that out to you as soon as it's posted. And then a couple questions here, Evan. Um, I guess I'm going to try and present them to you in a way that makes the most sense. Um, so there's a question here that relates to some of the analysis that you did. Um, so we talked about uh, winter. Um, the question here is about summer. Um, were there any trends that you saw about summer? What do the summers look like? Were they also hotter? Uh, yeah, so that was a great point, and that was actually a piece of the graph that I removed uh, just to make it less complicated. I did look at the summers as well. Um, the temperatures in the summers were, the average temperatures were the same for the four years. There was no extra electricity usage either. Um, the only change was the natural gas usage. So um, that was one thing I looked at as well, was well, was there more electricity usage in the summer because it was hotter, so more people needed air conditioning? But no, nope, that, that wasn't, the inst wasn't the case for those four years. But that's a good question. Yeah, great. Uh, another question around uh, methodology here um, from Greg. Uh, this is talking about community level uh, inventory. Um, so considering that there might have been uh, multiple electrical and natural gas utilities um, and that data would have had to be aggregated, um, how did you kind of develop a system for that? Yeah, so as I kind of mentioned, um, the our community data for electricity, our, elec our electric utility department here at the city of Lethbridge can monitor all the electricity that goes to the various different rate classes. So there's no need to reach out to a supplier for that information. Um, 
As for nat natural gas, we only have one supplier here in Lethbridge, it's Echo Gas. So they, uh, they supply all the natural gas to our city. So I can simply go to them for that type of data. I do recognize that living in BC uh, where you might have some different various suppliers that might cause more of trouble, but unfortunately I, I don't think I'd be able to speak on a good process for you simply because that's not the case here in Lethbridge. So I haven't really had much experience doing a different method. Yeah, yeah. So Greg is actually the RCA in BC. So if there are some BC mm -hmm. municipalities listening in, you can uh, contact Greg at the Community Energy Association. Um, he's saying that in BC that usually one utility provides electricity and natural gas. So uh, I think oh, okay. yeah, he's just looking for some contacts on that. So appreciate yeah. that one. Gotcha. Um, yeah, there's a question from Donald. Um, does the greenhouse gas inventory platform, so I think the PCP tool, allow users to compare performance. Um, I don't know, you have a thought on that one, Evan? Uh, from what I've seen on there, actually, there is a place on the web page to look at other municipalities, but they have to give approval in order to share their data. I'm not entirely sure, actually, if that's still on there or not. Um, so there may be, is my answer to that, there might be that opportunity to compare it to other cities, other municipalities. Yeah, I, th I think as far as, you know, community to community, that, that doesn't exist. I know it's been floated like a leaderboard of some kind to kind of create some competition. <clears throat> That'd be great to have. Um, and then you, you can, com I guess, compare, you know, internally, um, like your building to building or sector to sector. So. Um, we, we do know that, but not the community level comparison. Uh, perfect. There, there is a question um, about, uh, I guess, the community transportation data, um, and then it's around electric cars. Um, would electric cars be double counted with the mythology used? I guess the idea being that it would still show up in the kilometers traveled, but it would also show up electricity consumed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting thought on the, f uh, and this was just on the community side? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, if we were talking about the corporate side, we would know that that electricity is being pulled from a building of some sort. So we would know that there would be a little bit of a jump in electricity on the buildings. Um, mm, yeah. Interesting question though about the community side. I'm sure there is a process out there that isn't something that we have focused on because we haven't completed milestone two or three yet on the community side. So even yeah. the community initiatives for um, transportation or buildings, that's not something we focused here in Lethbridge on yet. We've just solely been focused on the corporation. Um, so I unfortunately I don't have an answer to that, but I'm, I'm, that's an interesting question. I think that yeah, that could be researched. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I think it shows that like, you know, the methodologies that we use, they, they work as an assumption, right? So mm -hmm. um, as we see uh, electric vehicles kind of increase in their in their market share or their, their kilometer share, um, mm -hmm. maybe we'll see new methodologies to help us uh, analyze that better. Yep, and I, I also just think that that's, that could probably be added into those discrepancies that I chatted about in the end of my presentation, mm -hmm. that it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be overlaps, yeah. at, at least a little bit of overlaps. But if we have that information that shows that a substantial amount of vehicles here in Lethbridge are electric, then yes, we will take some, take some actions to really narrow things down. But that's just simply not the case yet here in Lethbridge. Yeah, point. Okay, um, question here, um, can I get a bit more information on the asset planner? For example, we have significant amount of bills, hydrographs that take tremendous effort to process. Mm. Uh, I, I can't really speak to that because that's really managed in our asset, asset management department here in Lethbridge. Um, I use the program quite a bit, but I don't know so much about the um, purchase or, or how it's really operated. I just know that it is very, very good to use. Um, and like I mentioned in my presentation, yeah, it just compiles all the natural gas data, electricity data for all of our buildings. You can group your buildings into different categories. It's very mm -hmm. useful. Um, highly recommend that it's looked into for sure. Yeah, that question was from Vlad. Um, and then you know, Vlad, I don't know your situation, but uh, if you if you are able, you can usually request the aggregate data from 
your utility provider. Um, so they'll usually send you a spreadsheet, uh, which will save you the time from going from monthly bill to monthly bill. So hopefully that helps out and maybe you can uh, have a look at that asset planner um, as well. Okay, a bit of a pause here in the question. Um, there's one from Donald again, but it's it's incomplete. So I don't know, maybe you hit return too early, Donald, but if you're able to clarify on that, we can we can take that question. And if you do have questions, you know, following uh, following the, the end of this presentation, uh, you think of something, you know, while you're in the shower tomorrow, uh, you can always reach out. Um, I'm happy to try and answer questions the best I can. Um, I can't speak for Evan if he wants a bunch of emails in his inbox, but um, I, I'd be happy to pass that along if you have a question about yeah. Lethbridge as well. All right, uh, I think um, a bit of a lull, um, but we'll maybe give a couple minutes still as we still have a bit of time left in the schedule. Um, I, I will do a, a bit of a plug for just um, an evaluation form. Um, so we really appreciate everyone coming today. Um, and we do uh, have uh, an evaluation. This evaluation gets sent straight to FCM. Um, so if you like today's topic or you want to hear different topics, different case studies, you can let them know directly. I really appreciate um, people here sending that to them. Um, so yeah, there's the QR code on, on the screen. I'll also send uh, the link in the chat here as well, so you can if you follow that link, just let them know what you thought of uh, today's webinar. Perfect. But yeah, not not seeing too much more on the chat, um, so maybe uh, maybe end it um, a little bit early. A couple of nice comments coming in. I'm just uh, saying thank you. A very informative presentation. I appreciate those comments. Um, yeah. With that being said, I think we'll close it out a little bit early. Um, thanks again, Evan, for, for coming today and presenting on Lethbridge, um, letting people know what's going what's going on down there. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, thanks to everyone that was able to attend. And uh, yeah, um, have a have a good afternoon. <laughs>